she started. I'm ready. I'm sorry, I'm going. No, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's look at we're gonna we're gonna be talking about prayer tonight, and uh, so let's see here. Wilson's under the weather, so I'm kind of having to fill in for him uh, this evening. Uh, but let's go to two seventy five. Okay, two seventy five. Let's stand as we sing, okay? Hang on just a second here. <laughs> All right, let's stand as we sing. Here we go. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles, he is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, he all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me over the world the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Amen. Okay. Well, let's take our Bibles and we're going to continue our series in. And we are... Uh, just considering some of the things. You can go ahead and change it now to that. Okay. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 1, if you want to turn there. So we're looking at unveil, unveiling the infinite riches of Christ. And that's really what, what it's all about. And um, uh, this word in is just... It's all in Ephesians. And the last two weeks, we looked at, um, we, we looked at several things. We, uh, we saw 
what was in Christ, uh, which is an abundant inheritance, okay? Um, which that would, you'd, you'd find all of that from Ephesians chapter 1 to 14. And we explored the wealth of spiritual blessings found in Christ and then also emphasized our identity and our position in Christ and uh, just covered a whole lot of territory there. We're going to kind of just uh, to kind of revisit the whole uh, uh, section about prayer for just a moment before we get into the next one. Uh, but uh, we saw it was in Christ and now we're going to look at what's in prayer um, and then also we're going to uh, conclude tonight uh, with uh, uh, in power, all right? So in Christ, in prayer, and in power. And uh, so uh, let's uh, take a look at Ephesians chapter 1 here, and we're going to be uh, in verse 15, okay? Uh, and then we're going to just uh, we're going to read the verse 18. Well, let's just we'll just read the whole thing. OK, um, so 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, and, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Lord, I pray that you'd just, uh, just help us tonight as we uh, consider these truths that we find in uh, the book of Ephesians. And uh, I ask that uh, you would just uh, help us to just delve into these things and consider the power behind them. And Holy Spirit, we need your help. We need your guidance. And I, I ask that you would uh, just uh, use me to illuminate what is said from your word. The word has power. And Holy Spirit, we're asking that you would take the word and use it in a mighty way. And protect me from things that I shouldn't say. And help me to say everything you want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, so we're going to look, uh, first of all, um, from this passage at Paul's prayer for spiritual wisdom, okay? Um, now, I want to help you understand exactly what he means by his, as far as his prayer for spiritual wisdom. Okay, now notice that he says, uh, I, he says, uh, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is beyond the surface level of knowledge, all right? This is, uh, if you were to, if you were to, how many of you have seen the, the picture of an iceberg floating on the top and then it's underwater, big, huge, you know, the, the bulk of it is underwater. If knowledge were that iceberg, what we know is at the top, all right? As far as, as far as what to do, as far as his plans, as far as what he wants for New Grace Baptist Church, we're gonna just bring it down to New Grace Baptist Church. He's got a plan that, that spans beyond our comprehension. I understand that. But as far as New Grace Baptist Church is concerned, this is what he's talking about. He's, you know, if Ephesians was written to the church of Ephesus, but it's written for new grace. So what does he want from new grace? He wants us to know the knowledge that, 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 falls, that, that, that goes beyond the surface of what we know. He wants us to know great depths of knowledge, okay? Uh, Romans eleven thirty three says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Uh, Psalm 25 and verse 4 says, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Why would I want this? Well, turn to uh, Proverbs 3.13, okay, if you would. Um, 
if you turn, just hold your place here. And uh, Proverbs. You know, why would we want this kind of knowledge, all right? All right. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. It says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. My son... Let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in the way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, when thou, when, yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it cometh, for the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Now, what do we see here? Okay, let's break it down, all right? We see true happiness and joy. We see, more, um, we, we see that wisdom is more valuable than wealth, material wealth. Uh, we also see that uh, wisdom gives guidance and direction. All right, these are things we want. Right? We want guidance for New Grace Baptist Church. We want guidance for, indi for us individually. We want guidance for you know, America. But it's not going to happen until judgment begins at the house of God. Until we begin to judge ourselves and say, okay, do I really want this? And we really have to ask ourselves, do I want judgment to be at the house of God. And when I say judgment, you know, and those of you who are listening online, uh, you know, there, there's a, a common misconception about judgment beginning at the house of God. It's not that God has to judge his house first and they compare it, they take it out of context and they say, well, you know, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ and then the great white throne judgment. Okay. I realize that it's in that order, but when it says judgment must begin at the house of God, it's talking about all of this has to happen in the church first before it's going to happen outside of the church. The church has to be revived if, if we're, you know, when, when people say, Lord, we pray for an awakening in our country. Well, God says, I'll give an awakening, but you need to be revived first. Because ultimately, we're the reflection of who he is. Uh, you know, he said in John, he said, the world does not see me anymore, but you see me. And so, uh, so he, he's saying, when, when you get down on your face and recognize that you need me, then I'll reach out to the world. So, so we need these things, all right? Why, why is it that we need to ask for, for wisdom? Because there's, there's joy in having wisdom. I, I like knowing what to do. There's nothing more wonderful than to come in to a church with confidence knowing what we're going to do, knowing what our church has on the agenda for the year, for the months, uh, you know, the, there's, there's nothing more helpful to know this is where my family's headed. And, uh, you know, there's, there's times where we're replete. We have no wisdom at all. And so that's when we say, Lord, I need wisdom. Because if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That giveth to all men liberally. So you've, you have true happiness and joy. More, uh, it's more valuable than material wealth. Uh, it, it gives guidance and direction. <laughs> Listen to this, longevity and well-being. Longevity and well-being. That means, that means you live a healthier, happier life. You're, you're, you don't, you're not going to be so stressed all the time when you have the right kind of wisdom. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, it, it, it provides trust in the Lord. And I love the final one that we find in verse 21 to 24, security and fearlessness. Boy, I'll tell you, that's something that we need in, 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 our, in our church today. We need boldness. We need, we need fearlessness. Uh, and all of this comes with wisdom from God's word. Um, so, you know, what exactly does this look like? Well, I kind of did a little bit of a case study 
uh, tonight with Daniel. All right, we're going to take these things and apply it to Daniel. Who was Daniel? Daniel was a man who had been taken from his family and made a slave, made a eunuch. Basically, when they turned him into a eunuch, that meant he's not going to ever have children. I mean, it, it, is, it was a devastating time for, for a man not to be able to have children. That was a, that was a terrible, a detrimental thing. It's something that, that, that brought great depression on many men at that time because it was, it was, a, it, it was a blessing. It was a, a tremendous thing to be able to say, I have children. And uh, he was not able to do that. Not only that, but he never saw his family again, most likely. He never saw his home again. Imagine being taken from a place that you love and you never get to go back and see it again. That, that, that would be hard. Um, you know, uh, maybe he hoped that he would. But Daniel, if there was anybody in the world that had problems, it was Daniel. He was surrounded by... Uh, he was surrounded by gods. He was, I mean, the king was vicious. Uh, you know, his name was changed. Imagine, I mean, personally, I like my name. <laughs> I like Michael. I don't want another name. And, and, and this, you know, this king comes and gives Daniel another name, Balthazar. And then he gives Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he gives them the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But yet, we see that Daniel, in the wisdom that God gave him, had true happiness and joy. And here's an example. Um, if you want to turn to, uh, if you want to turn here, hold your place in Ephesians, okay? But go to Daniel, and uh, we're going to just look at a few, uh, a few sections of Scripture from Daniel. Um, this is, uh, you, you know the story with King Darius, Daniel chapter 6, okay? Daniel chapter 6. The decree that was signed, they kind of bamboozled King Darius into signing this petition that nobody was allowed to worship anybody but Darius. Kind of gave him the big head for a moment, and, and then he came to himself and realized that he had basically sealed Daniel's fate because Daniel was not going to stop praying. And so verse, uh, look, look what it says, all right? Uh, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. I'm gonna tell you something. When I give thanks to God, uh, it's, it's with, a, it's, it's, it's with a, a cheerful heart. I've never said, thank you. Now, I, I, I might have said it facetiously. Thanks. You know, when I'm in a bad mood, I pray, and I, I, you know, I, I regret those times. I'm thankful for his mercy. But there's been times where I've been like, thanks a lot, God. I appreciate that. That's really encouraging, you know. I was very facetious, very, very insulting about it. Uh, but... When I'm truly giving thanks and praising God, I'm going to do it with a joyful heart. Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. And this was Daniel's attitude. Daniel did it three times a day. Things were difficult. He was surrounded by idol worshipers. There's no telling what kind of things he saw in Babylon. There's no telling, uh, you know, the, the, the people who were, who were killed in Babylon. He watched his own king get killed, probably. Um, you had a... a, a, a and I'm, I'm trying to think of what his name was, Zedekiah, King Zedekiah. He got taken into Babylon. He got arrested, you know, got taken into Babylon. They, uh, they killed his sons, and then they put his eyes out. And I'm, I'm sure Daniel must have heard about it. Oh, man. He probably wondered if his mom and dad were still alive. He got turned into a eunuch, never have children again. And he's made to serve this pagan king. And he's probably thinking in his head, you know, I, I really... I don't think I did anything to deserve this. I think sometimes Daniel might have wondered if, if it had been better to have been killed. But he had problems, but he focused on the solution. Notice that it says that he gave thanks before his God. All right? Now, wisdom is also more valuable than material wealth. Look at Daniel chapter 5 now. Okay, go back. We're going to kind of skip around here. 
Daniel recognized wisdom as being more valuable than material wealth. He says, says in uh, chapter 16, And I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve, and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. All right, now imagine, right before this happened, there's a woman that comes walking in. All right, they're, they're, having a, they're having a blasphemous party that they take God's silverware, God's cups, bowls, spoons from the temple, and they're praising the gods of gold with them. And I can just see God going down and looking and going, that's mine. <laughs> what do you mean you're praising the gods of gold? And he goes up to the wall and you're going to die tonight, pal. <laughs> And uh, so he can't interpret it. He calls the astrologers. They can't do it. And here comes this little old lady. And I think it's Nebuchadnezzar's wife. I think it's his grandmother. And she says, I know a guy that that you guys have kind of put away and kind of demoted. His name is Daniel. He was very prosperous during my husband's reign. Maybe he can help you. And Belshazzar calls him in and he says what he says. He says, I'm going to promote you. I'll give you all this stuff. I'll clothe you in scarlet and put a chain of gold about your neck and you'll be the third ruler in the kingdom. Imagine a former president coming up and saying, I knew a guy and they named you, a president of the United States, a former president to the current president. And the current president says, if you can interpret this, I'm going to make you the secretary of state. (laughs) Look what Daniel says, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another. Hmm. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Do you know why he said that? He said, this stuff isn't going to matter anyway. You're getting ready to die and this kingdom's getting ready to be taken over by Darius. He didn't know his name was Darius, but at this time he knew that it was over. But he knew who God was. And he was confident in his God. Um, Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and they were created for him. You were created for God. It's not about money. It's not about promotion. It's not about anything else except you doing God's plan. That's where you're going to be the happiest. The more you know God, the more you know his plan, the more happy you'll be. Uh, Then guidance and direction. Daniel chapter 2. Turn there. Wisdom provides guidance and direction based on Proverbs chapter 3. But we're looking at this little case study of Daniel as far as whether this stuff really is true. Daniel is a, you know, I, I'm just going to pause for a second and just say this. Daniel was a wise man. He was well-trained. I'm sure that he knew a lot of things. I understand that. Um, but, but, but I'm going to also say this. Anybody could have been a Daniel. Because Daniel had a God who gave him knowledge that went below the surface. Daniel had that kind of knowledge. Why? Because he knew his God. The more we know our God, the deeper the knowledge we have. Oh, the depths of the riches, both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his truths and his his knowledge past finding, his ways past finding out. But guidance and direction, look look at uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 16. This is after Nebuchadnezzar had the statue, he had the dream of the statue, but he wouldn't tell... He was very unfair. The, uh, the, the, the magicians and the wise men come in and they say, okay, well, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. And he goes, I forgot. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean you forgot? Oh, I forgot. Aren't you an astrologer? You're supposed to help me remember, so remember. And he goes, uh-huh. well, tell us the dream and we'll, we'll, we'll interpret it for you. He goes, I'll tell you what. If you can't remember it for me, I'm going to have you cut in pieces and I'm going to turn your house into a dunghill. <laughs> Look, not even the, you know, not even the gods can do this. <laughs> That's what they said. And uh, he goes, okay, fine. 
So be it. Have them cut in pieces and their houses turned into a dunghill. Daniel's being taken away to be killed. And he's like, what is with the king's haste? Why have we all been arrested? What's going on? <laughs> and they say, well, they couldn't interpret this thing. And so Daniel says, hey, you know, I can't interpret it, but I, I do know of one who can. His name is Jehovah, <laughs> right? And uh, so he gets brought before him. Look at verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. He goes, okay, look, I'm not asking you to tell me the dream. I am asking for about five more minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm not, I don't know exactly how much time he asked for, but this guy was impatient. He goes, I'm just asking for a little bit more time before you go and do this, okay? And then it goes on, it says, then Daniel went to, the, to his house and made the thing known to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right, that's who they are, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire what? Mercies of what? God of heaven concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. All right, so you see more problems. He's lost his family. He's in a pagan culture. He's never going to see his home again. He's been turned into a eunuch. And now the king's getting ready to slaughter everybody. It's a massacre. But he goes to the solution. Got all these problems. Doesn't focus on them. He looks at the solution. You can fix it. See? Um, then, longevity and well-being. Hey, we know what happened with Daniel, don't we? He outlived five kings. That's what I call longevity and well-being. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Daniel, I guarantee you never complained. Hey, it's in the human nature to complain. But I'm going to tell you what, whenever I complain, and I did it today, but whenever I complain, I feel like my life force depletes. Whenever I complain, whenever I gripe, whenever I talk about how miserable everything is, I feel my heart getting heavy and I feel myself getting older. Oh, but when I rejoice, when I'm happy, when I'm having a good day, I feel renewed life within me. I feel invigorated. And it's what happened with Daniel. Daniel was a cheerful man. He chose to be happy. Happiness is a choice. Always has been, always will be. That's actually hanging up in my room. I'm kind of a negative Joe. And my wife has put that in my office so that I can look at it every day. <laughs> Happiness is a choice. Always has been, always will be. Straight and to the point. Longevity and well-being. Look at Daniel chapter 6. Here's a little example, all right? We know that he outlived all these kings, but here's a little example. Verse 18 of Daniel chapter 6. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. So here's Darius. Oh, man, Darius, you're such a moron. Why did you sign that petition? He's having a fit. Verse 19, then the king arose very early in the morning. Obviously, he couldn't sleep. Uh, and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, of course he is. <laughs> All right. And look, I, understand something. All right. When you read dialogue in the Bible, it's actually written for spiritual edification. You don't know everything that happened. So we can kind of use our imagination a little bit. I think Daniel was like, is my God able? How many times do I have to prove it to you, king? Oh, king, live forever. Yep, I'm alive. <laughs> He wasn't surprised. Verse 22. My God hath sent his angel 
and hath shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocence he was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And I can imagine him looking down at the lion saying, I don't know how many times this is going to happen before he believes me. <laughs> you know. But even James, Stephen, hey, they died. They were still joyful. Hey, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew they were going to die, didn't they? He said, they, they, said, uh, they said, we will not bow to these gods. They don't help us at all. We know the true God. We know the God that makes us happy. We know the God that gives us strength. We're not going to bow to that fool over there. We're going we're gonna to stand up every time the music plays. And he goes and, and uh, he says, whether the Lord deliver us or not, we're not going to do it. And uh, you go ahead and do what you want to do. So he, he gets mad and he heats up that thing. Wilson's got a forge. He, he just got a forge for Christmas. And I mean, that thing, when you turn that thing up, the heat, I mean, it just blows out of there. I mean, it's hot. This guy heated that forge up seven times hotter than it was normally heated. Full blast. Throw him in there. And those guys open the door and all those strong, his mightiest men, they fell down dead. They threw him into the furnace and they made it. But the reason why is because they had their focus on the solution and not the problem. All right, so, you know, um, here's another example, all right? Now, keep your place in Ephesians, all right? Now, we're done with Daniel, but look at Acts, all right? Turn to Acts, chapter 12. Here's a good example of, of having wisdom that provides us longevity and well-being, when you know your God, like the disciples, like Daniel, when you know them, when you know God, like these men, you can go through anything. You know, it's amazing, but in Ezekiel, it says there's only three men that are going to be able to deliver themselves by their own righteousness. It's really an interesting passage. You should look it up. The only men who are going to be able to deliver themselves, I mean, I... I, would, I can think of several that might have been able to, but he only named three. Job, Noah, Daniel. Those men suffered. But you know what they learned to do? They learned that Jesus, that God, is always the solution. You know, there's a, a verse, a passage of Scripture. I didn't think I was going to actually share this, but I think I'm going to. Um, but there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 41 and it basically says that the Lord will strengthen me. He will help me. He says, be not, be not dismayed for I am thy God. I can't remember exactly how, how it's worded, but I want to focus on the, the phrase dismayed. Do you know what dismayed means? It means that you're terrified about something that's going to happen. Be not dismayed. You are terrified. And as a matter of fact, you are so terrified that you'd rather die than go through what you think you're about to go through. That's what it means to be dismayed. I would rather die than to have to go through that. You know, there are some people who dread, they fear losing their spouse. They fear losing one of their children and they say, I'd rather die than go through that. Be not dismayed. You see, we focus on all these problems. We focus on all these situations. And we, we, the reason why is because we've got to be in control, but we've got to let go of all that. And we've got to look at the solution and we've got to say, you're in control, God. That's why we call this church new grace. He gives us new grace for every new trial that we face. That's what it's all about. Acts chapter 12, look at this. Here's a good example. All right. Acts chapter 12, and it says in verse 1, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. Just like that. I mean, James was one of the guys that saw Jesus transfigured. He was one of the guys in the circle, in the, in the, in the inner circle. With God, with, with Jesus, 
in the garden. He took James, Peter, and John. He says, come with me, guys. You guys are my inner circle. James was killed. I'm sure the other disciples were like, I thought that he had a future going for him. But James died a happy man. He died with longevity. He died with strength, with well-being. But you know what? Look what it says. He killed the... All right, look at verse 3. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping. <laughs> and you think about that, all right? Peter's getting ready to die. He probably saw his friend die a very wretched, cruel death. I don't know how they killed him. It says they killed him with the sword. It must have been a terrible sight. It must have been, maybe he was beheaded. I, I think it's possible that they took the sword and cut his head off. But it's possible Peter heard about it and he's like, oh no. And then all of a sudden, Peter, you're next. Open the door. He gets arrested. You know, he's, he's asleep. Why? God's in control. He's got wisdom. He's got knowledge. Hey, I think I know somebody else who was asleep during a perilous time. Who? Jesus. Jesus. He's asleep in a boat that was full of water. Well, Jesus is God. You know, yeah, Jesus is God, but Peter wasn't. They both had the same kind of spirit. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But Stephen, while he was being stoned, said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. They all had the joy of God in them. I want that. I really do. I really do. Wisdom brings trust in the Lord, security and fearlessness. Uh, you know, I, I think we can agree that Daniel was secure and, f and fearless. Jimmy Baldwin, he was a civil rights activist. He said, the most dangerous creation in any society is the man with nothing to lose. You think about that. If you have nothing to lose, what are you going to, what, what, what are you waiting for? Charge, Right? The most dangerous creation in society is the man with nothing to lose. Now, most of us would say, yeah, that makes sense. Daniel was a man with nothing to lose because he had a God that he could never lose. He, had, he, he, he not only had nothing to lose, he had the solution that he could never lose. That's what made Daniel who he was. So... We have understanding the key role of prayer in revealing the infinite riches of Christ. And we looked at this, and I'm going to just look at this briefly really quick. Knowing Jesus personally, knowing Jesus' plan, and knowing his potential to carry you through that plan. That's, all, that's really what all this is about. He's saying, I want you to have this wisdom so that you can know Jesus personally. That's the first thing, knowing Jesus, knowing the solution. And then as you know him as the solution and you know who he is, he will reveal his plan to you. And not only that, but he's going to give you the potential to fulfill what he wants you to do. You know, um, he said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. When, you said, when it says thoughts, it actually means plans. Plans of peace, not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. He says, I have plans for you. But it says... I know my plans. Didn't say he knew yours. He said, I have plans for you. I know what they are. And then we have another passage of scripture that says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Basically what that's saying is, is you either decide you're going to line yourself up with God's plan or you're going to try to figure it out yourself without God. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Reading five verses a day is not going to fix it. Reading five verses a day, reading one verse a day. Look, there's a good time to get started somewhere if you're not reading the Bible. But if you are reading the Bible, you need to start, you need to start 
chewing on the word. You need to abide in the word and get to know who Jesus is. Look at the solution each time you read. Where's the solution? Whenever you read a problem in the Bible, say, where's the solution? What's the solution going to do? And the more that happens, God will begin to reveal his plan for you. And then when you see it, you're going to go, I can't do that. And he's going to go, I'm glad you said that because I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the potential, the power to be able to do it. Which finally leads us to the third point in our, in our message. And we'll get into detail with this next time in chapter two. But in power... So we looked at in Christ in prayer, in Christ's authority and his, his headship, all right? So look, let's look at chapter, uh, verse 19 here, okay? Or, or, yeah, verse 19 of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Do you know how many words for power there are in that little bitty verse? Six. You got dunamis, which means dynamite type of power, all right? It's inerrant power or ability. Then you have energeia, which is where we get the word energy from, all right? That's translated a working or an operation. Then you have iscus, which is translated strength or power. It's emphasizing an arid or manifested strength. And then hyperbalo, which is translated as exceeding or surpassing, indicating going beyond a certain measure. Then you have megthos, translated as greatness, expressing the idea of size, extent, or magnitude of that power. Kratos, translated as might or strength, referring to dominion or sovereign power. So the verse emphasizes not only God's power, which is dunamis, energeia, and ixcus, but also the exceeding, surpassing, and great nature of that power. And that's all within that one little verse. <laughs> Let's look at it again. Look at it again. After everything I just said, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us for who believe? according to the working of his mighty power. God's saying, I'm going to come down with all I've got to help you do what I want you to do. <laughs> Six words about power in that little bitty verse. And by the way, did you notice what was right in the middle of it? To everyone who what? 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 Everyone who what? Come on, guys. I'm listening. I'm waiting. Close. Very close, buddy. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and count it. Yes, I'm going to count that too. All, both, of those are, both of those are acts of faith. So look what it says. All right, look what it says. To those who believe. Come on, adults. You're letting the kids. I already said it. Too late. All right. So, believing, all right? Notice what it says again, all right? Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who, what? Say it. Believing. Huh? Believing. Believing, all right, all right. Come on, guys. All right, so what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Right in the middle, those six words. You got, you got three words Faith, and then three more words about power. All you got to do is believe. All you got to do is believe. That's what it's about. And then finally, recognizing Christ's authority and headship over all things. Not only does he enable us, but his power is available to all that would hind against all that would hinder us. Did you hear what I just said? All right. Not only does he enable us to do what he wants us to do, but his power is against all who would hinder us. And so we see at the very end of that chapter, all right, and hath put all things, or I'm sorry, uh, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name, including Satan, that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And it put all things under his feet 
and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, which is his body, which is his body. Do you know what that means? That means that just as Jesus Christ was raised far above all principality and power and might and dominion, it also means that those who are a part of his body have done the same. And we'll study that a little bit next time. But we're able to stand against the powers of darkness. We might not be able to go up to the president and say, you're not going to do this, all right? But you can hinder the one who works behind our leaders. And we can change the world as a result. So Lord, I pray that you'd just help us as we consider these things. Lord, I thank you for all that we've seen within the scriptures. And I just ask that you'd help us to just consider what we've read. And Lord, we pray that it would give us that extra, that that boost of faith, knowing that there's something you have for each of us and also collectively as a church body to do for you. And so Lord, help us to, to keep those things in mind as we, as, we, uh, as we go tonight in Jesus' name, amen.